I'm passionate about work. I'm passionate about how I and you and my students and your kids learn to have great working lives. For me, it's one of the most important aspects of our life, so let's make work great. Now, the challenge with work is that it changes. It changes all the time, and over the last 20, actually 30 years, I've been taking a look at why our work changes and also asking what do we do to keep up with those changes, but indeed to thrive with those changes. So let me, first of all, share with you the three big trends which I study and I believe fundamentally change the way that we work, and the way that we think about our work. The first is demographic changes. You know, the truth is that where many of us are going to live a great deal longer than our parents, certainly than our grandparents, and our children may well live longer than us. And when life gets longer, our attitude to work changes. Why? Well, because if you think that you can retire at 60 and live to 100, you certainly can do that. But either you save 20% of your income. I don't know how many of you are doing that. Uh, or you earn a great deal of money, and maybe some of you will be doing that. Or you work longer. The truth of it is, and it's the truth that my, my uh, fellow London Business School professor, Andrew Scott, who's an economist, and I, a psychologist, wrote in The Hundred Year Life, one of our, the books we wrote together, you should really be planning to work into your 70s. And so immediately, our work is something that takes many years of our lives. But the other thing that's exciting and challenging about those longer lives and more years of work is that it's happening at a time of extraordinary technological change. All of us are confronted with the way that machines are changing our lives. We see it in our delivery work, we see it in factories, but of course we also experience it in our own work. And what that means is that we can imagine that up to 60% of our job will be done by a machine. And we have to prepare for that. So we're living longer, we're working longer, and we're working at a time of extraordinary technological change. But that's not the only thing. We're also fundamentally changing the way that we relate to each other, the families we work in, the communities we live in. And the piece that has most interested me over the years is women working and the impact that they're having. I was born in 1955 into a family which would be a very normal 1955 family in a wealthy country like the UK. Dad had a career Mum had, mum stayed at home and looked after us. So this was a perfectly normal way of working. And then by the 60s, uh, people like my mum would be having, a, a woman would have a job. Not a pension, not a career, but a job that she moved in and out of as she had kids. But what we're seeing now is right across most countries of the world, women work, and they work as soon as they have kids and following children, and many of them are now having careers. And so my family, where it was only really dad's job that was negotiated in terms of who does what, suddenly there are two people whose jobs are important and who are negotiated. So let's imagine where we are now. We're in a world where we're living longer, we're working for longer. We're in a world where we have to confront and also use the astonishing machines that are now being developed. And we're a world where, in a world where 
it's not just us that's working, but it's often other members of our family or people that we care about. And that's really the way that our world changed. And I have been studying that for more than 30 years. And frankly, I was sort of disappointed the way that organizations were catching up with that. But then something really odd happened, the pandemic. And what the pandemic did is it fundamentally changed the way that we thought about work. Uh, I wrote a, an article for Harvard Business Review, and, and, it, and I started it with the experience of Fujitsu. Why? It's a Japanese company. Japanese companies had been saying for years to me, no, no, Linda, everybody's got to stay in the office. Everybody's got to be there from 8 o'clock in the morning till 7 o'clock at night. Why? Oh, no, no, it's the only way to work. Well, suddenly, 60,000 people in Fujitsu moved out of the office into their home, and guess what? the world didn't collapse. You still worked. Now, that's of course, doesn't mean that everybody can work from home. In fact, even at the height of the pandemic, only 56% of people had any opportunity to work from home. Lots of people like my son, Dominic, who's a, a doctor, who was a doctor on a, on a COVID ward at the time, he couldn't work from home. He had to be in a hospital, and, and many, many people do. But what the pandemic fundamentally did is two things. First of all, it created a lot of experiments about how we work. Experiments which, which, by the way, we should have been doing years ago, but we weren't, and we now are. Experiments like, okay, maybe we can do this from home. Okay, maybe we can do this from a different country. Okay, maybe we can work uh, for four days a week rather than five. I mean, who knows? Lots of experiments, but also significant reassessments reassessments about why do I work like this? What does what my work mean to me? What meaning do I have from the work that I do? And together, that feeling about I have more flexibility about the time that I work in and about the place has created the most extraordinary change in the way that we work, probably honestly since the Industrial Revolution. It's changed everything. And what it's done is to bring it top of mind something that I and Andrew Scott had been thinking about for many years, which is what does a career look like? Now, if you'd ask my dad, David, about his career, he'd describe it as a three-stage career. He'd say, well, first of all, I'm educated, and then I work, and then I retire. And he retired at the age of 60, and, and had some enjoyment, actually, in terms of his retirement. That's not going to work for us. It's not going to work for me. It certainly isn't going to work for you. Why? Well, can you imagine that a time of extraordinary technolo technological change, you only are educated once? And can you imagine retiring at the age of 60 and then living till the age of 100, what are you going to do? I mean, that's a lot of years playing golf. So what you're doing is many of you are becoming almost social enterprises. I mean, you're almost saying to yourself, I want to do something different. And what you're doing is each of you separately, but some of you together, are creating a multi-stage life. And what does that look like? Well it's got more stages. So rather than the st three stages of full-time education, full-time work, full-time retirement, you're now bringing in new stages, like you know, starting your own business, or exploring the world, or building a portfolio. And you're doing that for yourself. You're not simply looking at what everybody else is doing, and imitating it. You know, the interesting thing about the three-stage life is everybody did it together at the same time. So you all went to school and education at the same age, you left, uh, you went into work, you got promoted in the same way, you retired in the same way. If you knew somebody's age, you knew their stage. But what we're seeing now with a multi-stage life is you could be exploring and going on a gap year 
at the age of 18, or at the age of 40, or even like me at the age of 67, actually 68, um, you can do whatever you want. And this is an astonishing and um, positive uh, way of thinking about our lives. But there's certain things that you need to do to make that work. And what I'd like to do is to give you my three top tips. Okay, three top tips for how you might make sure that you have a great work and a great working life. Tip number one. I know we're all worried about machines. And as a professor, I certainly am. Because you may say that machines take our work. Well, they certainly do. I mean, machines have just completely taken my work of assessing a student. Because honestly, ChatGPT can create an essay which I would probably not pass, but certainly looks pretty good. So we all have to imagine that machines are going to take some of our work. Where does that leave us? Well, the good news is that humans do a whole bunch of things that machines can't and probably will never do. What is that? Empathy. I know when you talk to a machine, it sounds as if it likes you. It might even sound as if it loves you. Believe me, it doesn't. It's a machine. It is not capable of empathy. But you as a human are. You know, you might use a machine and say, it's being creative. You know, I've asked it. One of the things I did was to ask it to write a, a, a story in the style of Linda Grattan. So they looked at all my books, it looked, and there it was. But it wasn't creative because machines only have the past. They don't have the future. They can't dream as you do. They can't imagine as you do. So tip number one, focus on those skills that only humans have. The skills of empathy, the skills of creativity, the skills of decision making, under complex circumstances. Now, just a point about that. Um, to do that, you need what I, as a psychologist, would call a rested brain. All of those things require your brain to be rested, to be creative, to be empathic. So one of the things that you need to think about is the way that you work in a way that allows you to have a rested brain, to have a brain that's fully human. Because frankly, if, you ha if your brain is so stressed and so tired, it can't empathize, it can't be creative. It's really no nothing more than a machine. Tip number one. Tip number two. There's been a lot of talk about hybrid and about, you know, where should I work? Should I work from the office? Should I work from home? And so on. Here's my perspective on this. I think what the pandemic did was to break our love affair with the office. And we, in fact, let's face it, it was never a love affair. We always hated the office, but now we've got a really good reason not to be there. And the office has got a really good reason to try and get us, bring us back. So the second tip is this. As you think about where and where and how you want to work, Ask yourself, what is it about the way I work that helps me be productive? And here's three ideas. I mean, it may be that you have a job that's a lot about focus. That's my job, by the way, because fundamentally, I'm a writer. And as any of you know who write, it's, a, it's an activity you do on your own with a closed door uh, for three or four hours on a very regular basis. It's focused work. So the most important thing for me is not to be interrupted. If I have an office where I can be on my own, that's great, but I basically need to be in a place where I'm not interrupted. Now, some of you have coordination roles, so really the most important thing you do is to coordinate with other people. Um, the most important thing there is that you do it. You don't need to be face-to-face -to, -face to coordinate. There's some incredible technology that allows you to do that. And so you can think about, how could I be creative about that? Maybe I don't need to live in this particular country to coordinate with others, because technology allows me to do that. 
But many of us have part of our job that makes us successful and valuable, which is around cooperation. And what we know about cooperation is although there is something to be said for cooperating in a virtual environment, being face to face with somebody and working with them in, a, in, an, in, a, in an intuitive and creative way is an astonishing part of the, co the act of cooperation. So if you are going to the office, that's what you should be doing. Not the focus stuff, unless you've got a quiet office, which most of you haven't. Probably not even the coordination stuff, because honestly, you can do that online. It's the cooperation stuff. But there's one more thing that I want to suggest to you, and it's my third tip. You know, what was really fascinating about uh, the whole pandemic experience, and I kept a diary uh, from day one. So I have, I think, 24 volumes now of diaries of what I heard. So I sort of followed that through, and I wrote extensively about it. The book I wrote, Redesigning Work, was really about that diary, what I'd learned. And this is one of the things I learned. That when we started working from home, we sort of loved it, and then we sort of began to hate it. And the reason we began to hate it is we got lonely. And we suddenly realized that one of the things that we loved about work and loved about being with others is friendship. You know, you perhaps know that one of the items that predicts whether you stay in your job or you leave, leave it is, I have a best friend at work. You know, we're very naive if we think that work is uh, something beyond friendship. It isn't, it is about friendship, it is about relationship, it is about networks. And I just wanted to say in my third tip that you need right now, we need to reimagine our relationships and our friendships. And I would suggest you think about that in three ways. Number one, uh, you learn most often it, with, it, with people that you know well, the way you're able to share what we call tacit knowledge, you know, deep knowledge about the task you're involved with or your knowledge base. So make sure that you have people around you who you can grow with and share information with. But actually, quite a lot of value comes when you are bridged in terms of a network with someone who's quite different from you. So for example, The Hundred Year Life is my most successful book. And I think one of the reasons it was really successful is I, as a psychologist, worked with an economist. That's actually a relationship that's very, very unusual for a psychologist to work with a macro, not a micro, a macro economist. And that's where some of the deep ideas from a hundred year life came from. That was bridging. It was, it's been one of the most valuable networks in my whole uh, working life. And the third are those diverse networks of people who are entirely different from you, who can bring you ideas, inspiration, and maybe courage to be something different. Because uh, multi-stage life is a lot about transitions, and each transition is an, a transition in your identity. Uh, and the way that you manage that is by having a diverse network of people who are different from you, because one of those people might have the identity that you would like in the future. So, top three tips. Number one, build skills that are hard to substitute. Number two, understand how and when you are productive. And number three, maximize the impact of your friendships and your relationships. Thank you.